all the traditional custard. Sorry, I'll just get that out of the way. <laughs> I just, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Biripai people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather here today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Uh, I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that are here with us at our information session today. Uh, and second, I'd like to thank all everyone for coming and coming along and uh, being interested in um, feral deer and feral deer management. Um, it's a it's a very it's a complex issue uh, being. Um, you know, you've got we've got them in urban areas and rural areas, and uh, they don't they don't stick into the same boundary. So they they go across land boundaries, and it's a really really complex issue. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just thought I'd it would be really interesting to sort of talk about uh, feral deer in our area. Um, a little bit about Hastings Landcare for those who who don't know about Hastings Landcare or have come in via a different um, than our mailing list. So Hastings Landcare, we're all about uh, building our community. So strengthening our community by uh, being our groups and members and supporters, enhancing our environment through projects and volunteers and landcare work and supporting sustainable agriculture. Um, yeah, through different projects and awareness and workshops. Uh, we're made up of different members, so that sort of correlates. So we've got our membership, which is uh, consists of uh, volunteers who work on like bush care groups that work on public land, uh, restoring the bush, weed control, rubbish collection, planting, um, yeah, bush regeneration, all of that sort of thing. Um, they consist of our members. We've also got a large proportion of our members are rural landholders. Um, last time I checked, it was actually something like seventy percent of our membership are rural rural landholders uh, doing doing really great things on their properties. Um, like uh, yeah, like like managing uh managing their property but also looking um also managing their natural assets as well um so it's a real um yeah a lot of people planting trees and um fencing off stream watering um different ways of setting up dams so the rural landholders are the other portion of our membership and then we also have just general supporters uh, who like what Landcare does and want to support. So, um, so they do that by joining. It's just fifteen dollars a uh, a year, and um, yeah. So that's that's sort of our membership. And if you'd like to keep in contact, um, you can subscribe to our mailing list or um, or follow us on Facebook. But most of our grants and workshops and uh, field days all come out through our mailing list first, um, but it, they also come up on Facebook as well, but it, it might not be as reliable. Um, yeah, and we link air and we do events like this because um, in link air we we really value, um learning and sharing from one another and supporting each other in um you know in managing land and and tackling issues it's always better to do it together um and it's always better to share and learn so um yeah so i just um and i also just yeah like with every workshop we do i always um always say this is a really we want this to be a safe place to ask questions and to share and learn. So we ask everyone to just be respectful of each other's opinions and ideas. And um, <laughs> like every like every issue, particularly with land management, there's lots of different ideas and opinions. So 
sometimes, yeah, sometimes you have to agree to disagree. Um, and and lastly, a huge thanks to our presenters today. Um, we've got Emma Sawyers. Um, well, before I get into that, uh, a huge thanks to, just for them being uh, generous with their sharing of their knowledge. So, uh, yeah, without without people like that, um, yeah, we don't learn more and the community doesn't learn more. So I really appreciate um, Emma and Mick coming to talk today to, yeah, generously share what they've, their learning and experience um, with feral deer. So, um, yeah, so we've got Emma Sawyers from the Department of Primary Industry. She's been, <laughs> she's waving now, and she's been in uh, the industry for seven years, specialising in vertebrate, pre vertebrate pre pest research. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, she's been um, recently um, been involved in supporting communities in the use of feral scan, which uh, allows community members to report sightings of feral species. In this case, we're talking about deer, uh, which is fantastic. It gives a, a lot of information to the relevant people like DPI and local land services. Um, she also uh, works to connect people to best practice pest animal uh, resources. Uh, so uh, resources that might help people controlling or managing a pest on, on, on their property or in their community and also training in the pest animal space as well. So, so thank you for coming along, Emma. <laughs> and we've also got Mick Elliott, um, who's the biosecurity officer uh, from North Coast Local Land Services. He's been with them for eight years, uh, assisting landholders with management um, and control of invasive pests. Um, and his past experience uh, is in large herbivore control. So uh, he's got experience in, in that area, which is perfect for our feral deer. Um, and he's gained that in working across a number of states and territories. So he's very well experienced. Um, yeah, so again, really thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, our generous speakers, and I'll uh, I'll hand it over to Emma first or Mick first. Um, I think we might go uh, Mick first because he will be able to set the scene nicely, nicely for um, my presentation. Um, and I'll just add there, um, we've uh, popped everyone on mute, but um, we'll do a quick um, Q&A after Mick's presentation and after mine. Um, so if you could um, hold your questions till after the presentation, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so although I may have experience in large herbivore control, my experience in Zoom meetings is quite limited. So please bear with me while I get this going. So I'll hit the share screen, anything could happen here. How's that look, Emma? Looking good so far. Let's try and get the show on the road from the no, beginning. I just need to shift that out the road. Yeah. Okay, how are we going? It's uh, black at the moment. Um, we might need to do that again. So let's stop the screen share. Yes, You're on the money, off you go. Does it every time, eh? Hey? Let's, let's hiccups through. Okay, everyone, thanks. Look, thanks for your interest and thanks for showing up. And um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Hastings Land Care has um, been one of the people that we've dealt with a number of times and it's always great to, um, to be involved. So what you're seeing there is a, um, is a picture that I'm, I'm sure a lot of the Port Macquarie people have seen before. We have um, three deer 
sitting in someone's backyard. And uh, this is where most, most um, people come across deer. Um, certainly they see the impacts of, of deer around their gardens and, and, and sometimes on the road, which is um, obviously a major problem for us. But um, I wanted to show that this is, this is a photo that um, so many people would be, would be um, um, comfortable seeing to begin with. The biggest issue that we have with feral deer is that they are such a novelty to begin with. Um, it's it's well known when there's you know three or four that it's, it's a it's a wonderful thing to see, but when there's thirty four, not so good anymore. So they were first um, recognised as a problem in the nineteen eighties. Um, certainly, there's been a number of of records of that and um, they've continued to grow and spread. And important to remember that they were protected by law back then. So it was illegal to, to actually to um, control them. And uh, it wasn't until that law was lifted that um, control became a lot easier for, for, any, for a lot of people. Um, what you're seeing there is, is pictures of Rusa. Uh, Rooster are the deer that most people will see around Port Macquarie. Um, they're certainly in the greatest number and have become, importantly, it's important to note they've become habituated to human movement and noise. So that means that once upon a time, deer would run from these sorts of things and nowadays, not so much. They, um, especially when you get to a, to a rut season, they become quite, uh, they can become quite aggressive and and um, without pushback, will remain there and actually um, just stamp their foot. And and um, you have to physically move towards them to get them to to shift out of a garden type area. Um, some of the some of the other deer that you might see around the place are, um, are fallow. Um, these are there's still a number of these around. Um, for recognition, it's always good to look at this at the hind. That black tail is a fairly good um, tool to recognise fallow. Um, I've got to say that they've been pushed mainly pushed out a lot by the rooster and a lot of control. Um, anecdotally, fallow are seen uh, recognised as the least invasive of of deer, um, and that only becomes that's only because they they're a, much more a herd. A herding animal, so they're, they're happier when they're in a big mob. Um, quite often, you'll see them um, in the middle of a paddock, and um, as soon as there's any movement around, they'll only shift when when disturbed, and then back into a forested area. So, um, what you're actually watching there is a samba hybrid with a rusa. So. Unfortunately, we are seeing samba moving into the area too, especially in those um, um, more watery areas and or sort of swamp areas, if you like. And um, they seem to be coming from the south. They will readily hybridise with rusa. And in fact, because the stags are um, way bigger than, than uh, a rusa stag, we'll, we'll actually shove rusa out. So a stag there, that, that stag could likely be 300 kilos, 250 to 300 kilos. So what you're looking at there is an animal that's about as big as, a, say, a Jersey cow. Um, these are very big animals, and you can imagine what it's like to hit one of those in a car. Um, being big, they are also um, reasonably tough to move on once they've become habituated to human noise and sound. Uh, human activity and sound. Um, yeah, this one is a hybrid. Um, that we know that from the DNA sample we we're able to um, to take from him. He was controlled on a private property, and um, he had been creating havoc on that place for a long time. Um, some of the damage that that these sorts of animals um, can do, um, yeah, you know, they include overgrazing impacting on crops, um, trampling of, of um, planted 
areas. Um, even their their traps that they make through a forest are is a, is a um, a laneway or an entrance for weeds. Um, if there's uh, erosion can then start from that from that track. Um, their, their, as I say, the dispersal of weeds and um, their, their ability to accelerate erosion, um, especially with the de degradation of water quality around creek and rivers, which uh, these sorts of animals will wallow in, and um, the turbidity uh, of those creeks and rivers can be a major problem for any other animals work, uh, living in those creeks. Um, and in many, in many of the um, of these impacts have been observed in recovery areas, so areas of regeneration of little rainforest, uh, wetlands, uh, any of this sort of damage has, has been has been seen um, and recorded. Um, important to note too that um, feral deer are listed as a key threatening process by the Office of Environment and Heritage, so it's recognised that they are a proper problem. Um, the other one that that um, you may see about is, is chittle deer. So sometimes referred to as, as the prettiest of deer, um, but still have exactly the same problems. Don't see these around Port Macquarie, but certainly in other areas where we're working, uh, helping landholders in and around Port Macquarie, that photo there, you notice that mob of chittle and, um, and high rise in the background. They have adapted to that easily um, and are impacting all of those areas around there, especially in a dry time. They will, um, they will impact coming to people's gardens, down roads. Um, and in fact, um, just today, uh, we saw evidence of those right on, right on the beach in Coffs Harbour. Um, they certainly are to the west um, of the, of the uh, Port Macquarie Hastings area. Um, they're classed as a small to medium sized deer um, and they do retain their spots right from when they're a fawn right through to adulthood. Um, other, other deer fallow, uh, sometimes red, will have a light spot as, as their fawns. Uh, fallow can hold, hold on, on to spots right through adulthood, but it's more likely that you'll, there'll be chittle if you see deer of, um, of this sort. So, the, 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 as I said before, the major impacts that we see um, are vehicle collisions. And um, certainly that's the most hazardous interaction that we'll have. Um, that, that photo there is of a red deer that was um, hit on the highway. Um, they, they have a, a very ra a broad ranging palette, which, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to remember that. Um, they can potentially have a devastating impact on a plant community from the ground right through to as far up as they can reach. So that, that then can impact on the canopy of the trees that they are, are um, damaging. Um, highly mobile. These animals um, have no problem moving um, uh, large distances to, to find better food or to move away from a, a, a control area. Um, one of the things that I, I didn't mention about the vehicle collisions, that certainly around the Port Mac area, in one of the, the um, previous years that we've had, we're averaging around 15 vehicle collisions per year. And they range from, from major with vehicles written off um, through to minor. But uh, as you would appreciate from that, from that Samba hybrid, you hit one of those and that's major damage to your motor car. Um, stags of all of all breeds can become aggressive in the mating season. Um, they tend to use intimidation, so that that happens with um, harassment of livestock. Um, can actually happen with domestic pets as well. I have many instances or reports of um, of dogs not not wanting to go outside anymore when the when the stags are around. Um, another um, report to us was two stags fighting in someone's backyard and actually crashed him through a garden shed. So um, in the rut, they, they, you really need to avoid them. Um, so as I said before, they have a, a um, huge impact on planted crops. We have many reports of, of um, 
areas where people are growing produce for uh, vegetable produce and they can lose the lot overnight. Um, lots of people who are uh, about now planting ryegrass for, for cattle feed will have, see a huge increase of deer on their grass and can all of that work can be undone in a couple of nights. Um, um, fences have been tried to fit, like people might say, well, why don't you just fence them out? And, you know, as we know, a six foot fence is a pretty formidable fence for most things, but um, deer don't see a six foot fence as a particularly um, hard uh, object to get over. So um, as you can see there, these are some just some um, some impact photos um, just in someone's garden. This was sent to us by a person in Port, Port Macquarie who was tired of deer. And look, this, this is where the problem comes from. Control is extremely difficult. We only really have one, one way to control deer and, and that is with a firearm. There's no, there's no registered poison. Um, there's no, you can wish all you like, they're not gonna go away. You can try lights, you can try noise. And uh, much like most other pest animals, they, they get used to it pretty quickly. Um, and I'm, I'll just show you a few photos. Um, some people will have, will have recognised this. The, the damage from rubbing, you can see where um, antlers have been rubbed on here. There's some damage on this tree as well. The bark's completely removed off this one. This side of the tree is, is, is completely um, dead. So that tree, um, if it was in a canopy situation, wouldn't, wouldn't be providing canopy anymore. Um, here's you know, just some other um, examples. Here, all the bark has been taken completely off this, this um, branch. Um, these are in, you know, as you can see, that's in, in someone's, um, that was a front yard actually. Um, so I've put this one in. I want you to take note of the, these marks. You can see that mark. Um, you can see my um, arrow okay there. Can you see my... Um, just uh, move your arrow again. I can't see. I can't see your arrow. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'll be moving my one. I've been moving my arrow, but obviously it's not not noticed. If you have a look at that tree in front, and you have a look at that right hand branch that goes off, you can see there's a branch that comes towards the camera, and there's a mark there. Um, I point that out because I want to show you this. So this is that same tree. This is what um, what we refer to as a preach tree. Um, so that's old mate doing that for us again. So that's, um, this, the deer use these as um, to show ownership of an area, uh, dominance. So, and also they will um, rub, they've got a scent gland on their nasal cavity, which is just below their eye there. And they will stretch up and, and mark on that. So it is interpreted as a sign of dominance. If, if you can't reach this, you're not big enough, you shouldn't be around here, I'm, I'm the big boy. Um, and you can see them stretch right up there. So their ability to do damage right up to that to that first branch I spoke about is, is evident there. And again, that was in someone's backyard at Thrumster. Um, there's another one, that, that another tree there that, that is almost um, um, going backwards now. And, and if that continues, obviously that tree will die. I want to show you some plantings of a um, of one of our people who reported deer damage. That on the on my left there, hopefully it's the, the on your left as well, is a healthy avocado seedling that was planted. Um, this gentleman put in 400 avocado seedlings. This is the guy we spoke to yesterday, Emma. And as you can see, um, once this was overnight, mind you, and this is what happened to the avocado seedlings. Um, on the same property, we were um, fortunate enough to get some interesting trail camera photos. Um, this, this is a, a chittle stag. Um, and as you can see there, he's actually looking up underneath a plastic bag, which goes over the banana to protect the banana from too much sun and to also give it like a little microclimate for it to, to develop. And that deer has got up underneath that and um, and damage that banana bunch. 
which ended up like that. So that's the sort of damage there. And you can imagine the devastation that's going to happen through a plantation when that sort of damage happens. Um, I'll just show you a few, a few ideas of scat. Um, what you're seeing there is actually, that would be out of a stag. Um, because it's basically still joined together, it is segmented, but basically joined together. Um, here's some more, more than likely out of females. We see, we see stags, um, stag um, scats like that, and females like that. Um, interestingly enough, people always ask, um, what are, the, what are the things that you look for when, when you've got deer on your place? What should I be looking for? And yes, SCAT can, can give you that information. Um, even footprints can give you that, that information. That's a chittle deer print there. In reality, you're going to see damage or you're going to see deer. And that's, that's the important thing. Um, and you can you can um, see scat all over the place and, and most people won't recognise it for what it is. But if you don't have sheep and goats on your place and you're seeing scat like, like that last one, then you've got deer or you should reporting that you think you have deer. And I use that word reporting, it's the first time I've used it, but that is the key to, to um, effective um, feral deer control. If, if you don't report that you have feral deer, then it's not captured anywhere. It's only with you. So yes, um, Emma's gonna give you a, a great talk on, on reporting, but we can't emphasize enough the importance of simply that reporting. Um, it shows us distribution, it shows us populations. And although, you know, you might have two deer on your place and, and you know, you might think, yes, you'll report that and you mightn't hear anything back for a little while it's not because no one thinks it's important we will eventually get to you but we deal with with varying degrees of of these sorts of things and um, we have to make decisions based on that um, i guarantee you someone will ring you at some stage to find out find out how it's going and and we will we'll give a a recommendation about what we feel can happen from there um, just a quick follow-up here that's a mob of Rusa. This is habituation, um, and they'll take advantage of, of feed, op feed opportunities. So um, you can see the, those um, excavators working there, and the deer came in. That was taken about seven o'clock in the morning, so those guys were about to kick off. There was all movement in there. Um, yeah, astounding. Uh, recent survey that we did um, that. Um, um, we had 194 people reply to it um, and what, what had happened to them. And as you can see, 28% uh, had reported a traffic um, hazard of some sort. 47% um, of damage to gardens. Um, that's, that's what a lot of people in the urban, peri-urban area are finding now. Um, uh, and, and some other damages there. So it, it is a it is a it is a something that we we need to take seriously and and continue to to report and um, we'll that gives us the power to continue chasing these things um, and I just thought I'd throw that one in there they tend to be rude too um, so look I I just finished by by just giving you some some quick facts about about feral deer. Um, and just on the species themselves, um, uh, Rusa, we're about to come into the rut. So that means that's when the stags are, um, are tending to look for females. Um, it means that the calves, the, the uh, fawns or calves um, are on the ground. They, they would be on the ground now for Rusa. Their gestation period is around 250 days. Um, the, the rut for the stags will begin um, almost towards the end of May and run through, you know, certainly we're finding on the coast, run through till, till basically August. Um, we're certainly finding that uh, Rusa are, are tending to breed in longer periods on the coast. Uh, can get up to uh, 110 centimetres, uh, 135 kilos for the stags and, and the hinds around 60. And important to remember, they will hybridise. Um, 
hybridised with with Samba. And as I mentioned before, stags up around 300 kilos, hinds around 230. Uh, their rut, they are actually rutting in some places twice a year. Uh, that's around May, June. So we're, we're moving into that now and sometimes September, October. Um, Samba are, are extremely good swimmers and have been recorded swimming across um, from Southwest Rocks over towards uh, the Stewart's Point area. Uh, their gestation is uh, around eight months. Um, they tend to be a lone animal and tend to be um, um, only only getting together for um, for breeding purposes. We don't see many reds. Um, we certainly, see reds west of uh, west of the Hastings and up towards Kempsey. Um, stags can be 120 centimetres, around 160 kilos. Hines at about 90 kilos. Their rut is mainly late March through to early April. Uh, eight months gestation. Um, and so that leaves me with Chittle. So um, only a small to medium deer or class of small to medium. Um, about 90 centimetres, 80 kilos in weight. Hines, up at the stags, Hines about 80 centimetres. So nearly as tall, about 60 kilos. Uh, they can rut at any time. Fawns are normally seen uh, April, May, September, November. Uh, they have a gestation period of about 230 days. And they're one of two deer that can actually give you three, three fawns inside two years in the right conditions. And we're seeing that on the coast. Um, Ballet fall into that as well. And they have a gestation period of eight months. Um, they're, they're a bit smaller as well, about 90 centimetres and 90 kilos. Uh, those uh, 80, centim 80 centimetres and 40 kilos. Um, the only thing that I would mention about is control. Look, exclusion fencing can work. Uh, it is expensive, um, has to be well maintained. Uh, lights and noise, as I said before, have been have been tried, um, but with most best animals, it's it's normally only effective for a short time. Um, dogs have tried it many times, but a lot of people get sick and tired sick and tired of hearing dogs barking all the time. Um, as far as control goes, um, um, LLS is working with Port Macquarie Hastings Council, uh, private landholders, um, national parks, and wildlife service, forestry corp. Uh, DPI, Transport New South Wales, uh, um, New South Wales Police, and uh, we have the, the Hastings Feral Deer Plan. As part of that plan, a contractor is, is um, controlling deer, and most years he will, over the last, um, I think it's three or four years now, he has um, controlled over 100, 100 deer each year. Um, so look, that's a, that's an overview of of information that I can get. I'm happy to to take questions if that's good. If I can work out how to stop sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mick. There's a few questions that we've had come in, um, <clears throat> and I think that you have answered um, some of them in that. Um, do you trap deer in urban areas, um, which? is um, sort of site dependent, isn't it? It really is site dependent. Uh, yes, w look, we have. It's, um, as you'd appreciate, as I said before, uh, controlling deer with firearms. So the risk assessments that go along with that are, um, are, are obviously quite extensive. Uh, so we can we can control deer in, in urban areas, peri-urban areas. It's one of the things that we're working on trying to limit the um, the the risk involved, and that that's all about getting the deer in the right spot um, so that firearms can be used. As far as the, the contractor goes, his um, his control is normally on on um, acreage around Port Macquarie. Uh, so yeah, there's there's not there's not a great deal. There's a less risk there. Um, there's another question about deer movement. <clears throat> Um, so do, do deer move um, or use different parts of the landscape at different times during the day? Um, and I suppose we could talk about a corridor and feeding areas, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that can depend on, on um, the things that are pushing those deer around. So 
under under lots of circumstances, you'll find that deer, if you have a look at a map, a, a map of Port Macquarie, you can see lots of vegetation corridors that are normally uh, in lots of urban areas that run along creek lines where people basically can't build a house or can't can't have any sort of human um, like development. So um, deer will use those quite readily and use them more as a as a harbour. They don't have in lots of cases, they don't have a bedding area that they'll go back to every night, but they certainly have safe areas that they'll go back to. And what they'll do there is um, kick off about 4, 4.30 in the afternoon, especially as we're going into winter, and move up those, those corridors and then use those corridors to access people, uh, people's gardens, uh, lawns and, and mown areas. I mean, we, we like to have mown areas around us for all, that, for all the, the great reasons. Um, and deer love them as well because you're keeping the, the grass nice and sweet for them and low, um, uh, so it's attractive to deer as well. Um, and there's a question about what the most common deer species um, is in Port Macquarie. Yeah, definitely, definitely rusa. Um, without a doubt, uh, rusa. But we are seeing those hybrids moving in now, which is disturbing. But yeah, um, yeah without a doubt, rusa. Um, and in terms of the um, your collaboration with um, council, et cetera, um, I mean, that would mean that there's, you've got probably a number of sites you can control deer and you can't control deer. Um, I'm not sure how much information you'd like to um, give out about that, um, those sites. There's just a question about, um, yeah, is there any um, locations in and around town that you, you are trapping deer? Mm. Yeah, look, it's good and bad having to work in peri-urban areas because it makes us think outside the box, and that's that's what's occurring right now. Um, to to be successful in controlling deer in, in peri-urban areas, we have to change some of the thinking of of some agencies, and and I'll put my hand up to that as as well. Uh, a lot of my experience is in is in larger pastoral areas, so um, those sorts of control measures won't work in a peri-urban area. So um, look, we can, we can, we have, we have adapted to lots of those ways, and some of the things that we're working on now are proving successful. Um, it's not going to fix everyone's problem, but we're moving from shrugging and 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 wondering what the how how are we going to deal with this, how are we going to help people, to actually having a way forward. So, um, um, hopefully, that continues to have success. And, and yes, if there's an area around um, in our collaboration with Port Macquarie Council, if there's an area around that is showing um, deer impacts and we can get our, one of our, our traps in there, then we are absolutely exploring that. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I was reading the question. So there is a, um, a second question here, um, which is sort of, um, uh, what does it say? Hanging out during the day. Um, are they in nature corridors? Um, and yes, I suppose even just um, with our movement through Port Macquarie um, today, you see them sort of hanging out near highly vegetated areas and, um, you know, they'll come out for a bit of a feed and as soon as they're disturbed, they duck back into that, um, that harbour. So I suppose they're kind of near areas where they have, um, have that safety to sort of hide in. Yeah, look, absolutely. That's exactly what they do. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very involved thing. You, you know, you hear some people talk about, um, about animals. Animals are always going to be in a fluid motion about what's happening around them. When there's plenty of deer about, um, they, it's, it, they're not as nervous. When they start to be restricted, um, you can almost see them thinking, I could be next. So they become a lot, a lot more nervous, and that 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 is also true of when they move into a new area. Um, they move into a new area, they they are quite um, quite nervous about being there, so they will be close. But but I can tell you now, many reports of people who have to go out to their backyard and shake towels or or, or sheets to get them to go um, because they're used to it, you know. Um, and do you fit for human consumption? Pretty sure yeah, I've, absolutely had, they are. I've definitely um, had some deer before. Yeah, yeah look, absolutely. Um, um, the, the, the thing is that you can control deer on your, on your place. If you are a, a licensed firearm holder and you have an adequate, an adequate um, 
firearm caliber and it's your place then you are you are um, um I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be letting a, a shot off in the middle of Port Macquarie you might be in trouble but but certainly um you are entitled to to control that deer um and if you then choose to to um to go through the process and eat it um yeah absolutely um there's two questions we'll uh left here so um we, before we move on to my presentation. Uh, <laughs> the next one is um, just a question around what um, type of fencing is suitable for um, uh, to be used as exclusion fencing? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And it's, a, it's also a tough question. Um, certainly, uh, I have spent time um, on, on deer farms and uh, most guys on deer farms will tell you that the only fence that a deer won't jump is one he hasn't decided he wants to yet. Um, the, it, it depends on the situation. So uh, for example, I can think of one particular landholder who's, who's placed slopes away. Um, you could put a fence at the bottom of, uh, a, a bottom of, of that, at say, let's say five to six foot high, a wire fence. And if deer were coming up to that fence, it'd be highly unlikely for them to jump over it. But if, if they were coming the other way down, they would simply step over it. Um, the other thing is the, why are they trying to jump over it? If there's an easier way around to get to a feed, then deer will go around it. They're not stupid. Um, but if the only feed was in your place, then they're likely to jump a fence. So yes, um, um, netting fences will work um, of, a, of a particular height. I, I, I struggle to tell you exactly what will work because it depends on what species you're looking at and and what why the deer wants to jump that fence. If it's to jump in to get a feed, but there's a feed just down the road, they're going to go down the road. Um, if, if yours is the only feed or a particular feed that they need at a particular time of year, unfortunately, they're, they're likely to try and get over it. But you can, you can definitely... Um, fenced deer out. I, if I was going to do it and money wasn't an object, I'd be looking at really high uh, pool fencing so that it's um, it looks it looks tough to get over, and uh, I would fence it completely. But I'd definitely put a gate in it so you could let them out if they did get in there. Good advice, Mick. And in one sentence, um, what um, have you any idea of the numbers of deer around the Port Macquarie region? Uh, sorry, there's been lots of people that have said numbers, but well, pick a number and I'm happy to say yes, but I'm sorry, I can't, I can't tell you that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am conscious of the time, so I do want to show you through the feral scan resource um, quickly before we go. So as Mix mentioned, um, a big part of um, deer management um, is knowing where they are um, and knowing what's happening in the landscape. Um, and um, the only way to have a um, really good understanding of what's happening in the landscape is to have reports and um, records of uh, coming in from members of the um, community. So one way, um, one way that you can share that information is via feral scan. So I'm going to quickly take you through um, my presentation here. I'll just let that load. Now, how does that look for everyone? Is that okay? Great, thank you. So, um, feral scan um, is the umbrella term um, for a, um, a tool where people can record pest animal information. And tonight I'm specifically talking about the deer scan component of that tool. Um, so that's uh, myself and my um, colleague, Peter West, and we run this national um, project funded by a few different agencies um, down the bottom, including local land services and Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. People use deer scan uh, to help monitor deer activity. So you get an idea of um, uh, what areas deer are using, what time of the day, where are some hot spots. It um, lets people record and report. So I put in there um, record because there are groups out there who are working collectively in their local community 
to try and manage um, the uh, with the support of um, local agencies such as um, LLS. But um, there are people out there sort of banding together and using this information within the scam to help inform um, how they're managing um, deer within that local area. Um, and how to um, you know, uh, use that information to plan and document control. Um, and as Mick um, mentioned here, uh, this information is invaluable for um, people like um, Mick and the team around here, um, because they really need to know what's happening in um, the local landscape. So here's some types of records you can put into deer scan. So you can put in, um, if you see any um, scats or if you've got any damage to, um, gardens or vegetable patches. Um, you can certainly um, put images in uh, that you capture on um, wildlife cameras or on your phone. Um, if you've had um, any collisions with um, uh, deer impact the vehicles. Uh, if you're seeing deer um, in and around the township um, or perhaps if you're seeing deer in more remote um, areas as well or if you're having near misses um, for um, uh, vehicle incidents. This map's, um, it's a little bit dated. So this is 2016 to 2020, um, recognizing that there has been a, um, more expansion in these areas in recent years, um, especially with recent um, fire events too, we've had a lot of um, pest animals um, moving around to different parts of the landscape. But um, so just to give you a bit of an idea, um, the purple area is where they're still present and the red is where they're expanding to. Um, I would imagine that um, in this area where um, you're located, that, that this landscape would be quite different. And it's um, this part of this information has come through the feral scan system. So it'd be great um, to get more of an updated kind of information on what's happening locally. You can enter information about sightings or evidence. So if you're seeing prints or scat, if you see a deer in your um, backyard or front yard, entering information about damage or impacts that you might be experiencing. And if you are a small uh, landholder who, are, who is controlling deer, you can enter that information as well. Um, we have really strict privacy records within deer scan. So we don't um, release the information of where um, you're seeing deer or where you're controlling deer. Um, that information is only shared um, with Mick and the team. Um, and we also have zoom restrictions on the map, meaning that you can't zoom right down to see exactly where deer are located in the local area because we need to keep your, um, your privacy. Um, uh, yeah, we have a strict privacy settings within deer scan. Uh, so here's um, some more evidence uh, of deer, so again, wildlife cameras and scats. And you can enter damage or impacts such as um, tree rubs or damage to vegetation. Um, and if you see um, deer who, that have been killed by motor vehicles and um, other control activities you might wanna put in is uh, things like tree guards uh, or if you're um, attempting uh, deer trapping in and around your local area, it's just some examples. Of, um, can be used. Uh, I mentioned the zoom restriction. So if you're entering information about deer sightings and you went to the deer scan map, this is as much information as you can drill down to view. So for example, if I'm a hunter coming from Sydney and I wanna you know, have a look at what's happening in the North Coast region, there's no way that I'm going to be able to view that information at a detailed level. Um, it is important that we have the information on the map to show a general distribution of deer across the country, um, but only um, the details of those records are given to Mick and the team. Um, so I just want to really highlight that. There's a web page for deer scan, so you can create an account, you can um, record information through the web page. You can download the app if you access it via your phone. Um, and we've also got some helpful instructions and resources about the management, your identification, et cetera. Um, and that can all be found on the um, Deer Scan webpage. If you were to record deer using the webpage, 
you'd click on that um, map of Australia, you'd fill in the form, you'd click the um, map to place your marker pin of where, you, uh, where your record is, um, and then you'd hit submit. So it's pretty simple and easy to use. Um, the more frequently used part of um, DeerScan is the DeerScan app. And I'm going to show you a few um, features of the DeerScan app now. Don't freak out yet. I know it's technology. <laughs> okay, so this is the DeerScan app. It's free. It's available on Apple and Android devices. Once you've downloaded that, you select Deer, you select your record type, you fill in the form, and then you hit submit. So there's literally four little steps um, to entering that um, record. And that information's um, instantly sent through to Mick and the team. So here's an example, say you're out bushwalking in the, in the area or perhaps you're taking your, the dog for a walk down your, um, down your street and you see a deer, and you enter that um, using the deer scan map. That will send an alert to um, local government staff. And sometimes if it's set up, it may alert um, local landholder groups too. So not so much in the case of um, Port Macquarie Hastings area, but there are other um, landholder groups that um, sometimes receive that information. And that's all, um, that, that's all approved by us and by the um, people receiving that information. So just briefly, some um, benefits. It's a secure platform where you can record what you're seeing and the impacts that you're experiencing. Um, that helps keep LLS informed um, and then they can um, help you or help other um, people in the local area to plan and effectively manage deer um, over, a longer, um, over a longer period and over a um, broader landscape as well. Um, it helps to bring people together and work as a community um, to reduce deer numbers and to reduce the impacts and damage that deer are um, causing in the local area. It can help to prevent deer from becoming well established. So it's one of those tools in the toolbox. We need, it, um, we need to be using as many, um, as many things to try and tackle the deer issue locally. And this is uh, one way that you can um, be involved and help out. Um, it helps people collaborate to share resources and potentially seek funding because we have all this information in one spot. Um, and um, once we've got people communicating the issues and um, having that collective information in one spot, then um, it could potentially help leverage um, future funding as well. Um, just to finish off, um, Pete and I are here to help if you ever need assistance using the DeerScan resource. So feel free to give us a call, email us. Uh, we're happy to send out instruction guides like the one you see below, or if you're interested in a deer identification guide, we can either email that to you or we can post that to you. Um, we understand that this is technology and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So if you have um, questions you need ha a hand, changing your password or downloading the app, um, please just reach out and get in contact. At, we're more than happy to help. Um, so let us know uh, what you're in need of. Um, I will just stop sharing my screen. And I am conscious that it is nearly time. So um, I will take a few more questions, um, but we won't go too much over um, time this evening. Um, so some of the other questions. Um, this one might be best for you, Mick. Is there any way to tell between um, kangaroo or wallaby browsing? Uh, look, it would probably depend on on the plant, and um, and I would look for other signs. So, you know, both wallabies and kangaroos can have impacts, but. If you had, uh, let's say you had a sapling that had been stripped of everything, so ring, typically ring barked, um, I would be looking for other signs, scats, footprints around, but I, I, um, a sapling damage like that is more than likely deer. Um, most things will eat, let's say you put in lettuce or, or something like that, most things are gonna eat that. So 
you know, you'd want you'd want other signs to to try and back that up. Um, there's a question here about um, ticks and Lyme disease in Scandinavia. Um, what's your um, knowledge around um, diseases and things that are transmitted by um, deer um, in Australia? Uh, okay, so we've done a, we've actually done some research on this, um, and it was shown that the deer can certainly um, move uh, diseases around uh, for other stock. But um, there's conjecture from the medical opinion as to whether we actually have Lyme disease or a Lyme type disease in Australia, not been proven. So um, at this stage, uh, the jury's still out, but you know, probably above, above my pay grade. Certainly we'll shift ticks around without a doubt um, and, and things like that, they're, they're gonna shift on most animals. But um, yeah, as far as the, the actual one that affects uh, people or humans, um, yeah, jury's still out on that one. Thanks, Mick. Um, there's one more question for you, which was, um, you might not be able to answer this, but it was questions sort of around between um, Port Macquarie, Hastings, LGA and LLS. What sort of numbers of deer have been controlled over the last 12 months? In the last 12 months, um, there would probably be, and look, this is a rough thing. We haven't, we wouldn't have done any work on that certainly the floods and our bushfire response impacted that um, heavily our, our requirements you know we were required to be in Lismore for a, for a while I was personally there for a month so um, uh, look I know the contractor certainly controls over 100 every year he would he's on track to do that again um, um, but, but our our particular trapping hasn't been really been able to get to it at all in the wet it's just impossible. Yeah, and I suppose, um, yeah, with floods and yeah, COVID and race events, it's been... Yeah, we weren't, yeah. we weren't working in COVID at all. Like, I mean, yeah. we were working, but not with other people. Yeah. Um, and finally, this is a question for me here. So, <clears throat> yes, you can um, log information after the date. So it doesn't matter if that's a couple of hours or a couple of weeks or months. Um, if you log it through the app or the website, you have the option to change the date. If you're using the mobile app and you're at home sitting on your couch, it will record the deer location at your location. So the app is best used in field right at the time. It's really, really, it literally takes 10 seconds to use, if not less, once you've had your first run through. Um, so make sure you use the app in field and maybe use a laptop computer or something at home um, to find that location. Otherwise you'll have lots of deer sitting on the couch with you. <laughs> um, and I will send around an email after this webinar and I'll include a couple of photos because there's a comment um, asking for actual photos of the deer rather than the drawings. Um, I'll send around the deer, uh, um, the deer identification guide, which has the drawings and the written description of each deer, but I'll also send around a couple of photos of the common deer species in this local area as well, so you can have a bit of a comparison. Um, Emma, I'll, I'll yeah. just mention that one thing we didn't mention, that all the deer that are controlled in the Port Macquarie area and in actually the, the Coffs area, all go to Billabong Zoo. They're all, they're all, um, they're all utilised, they don't, they don't go to landfill. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, that was um, uh, interesting um, for me to learn that the other day too. Um, all right. I think that's it from me. In terms of deer skin, please, um, please try and utilise the resource. Um, as I mentioned, we're here to help. Give it a go. Jump on. Even if you want to put a test record in, write test in the notes field so we know that it's not a real record. But um, please um, record what you're seeing because it all helps in the bigger picture and um, for longer term. Um, I was, yeah, as I mentioned, I'll send an email out after this containing some more information and um, yeah, I'll uh, check with Mick and, you know, we'll pop some maybe contact details in there if you need to get in contact with his team and um, yeah, with, um, and provide some other resources as well. So yeah, that, and I'll also put a, uh, I'll put it out on our mailing list as well and um, so it won't just be you just entering your reports in, hopefully it'll be like many in the community um, 
which yeah will all go towards that important data that we need so yeah Beautiful. I'll send some instructions. I've just had another, one last question. So I'll send some instructions about downloading the app and registering, etc. Um, beautiful. All right. Well, um, we might wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for um, your time. And thank you, Mick, for coming online. Nice seeing your face again. And thank thanks, you. thanks, Steve, for reaching out and um, uh, for helping to coordinate this event as well. Um, it's really lovely work being able to um, work with you. Yeah, that's that's no worries. And yeah, I'll just uh, follow that up with saying thanks to both of you for coming again. So <laughs> and hopefully everyone got a lot out of it. So yeah, it was fantastic. Thank you. Enjoy Bye. your evening, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye.